For generations, uh, literally, literally for centuries, since the Enlightenment, New Testament scholars have been a little obsessed with understanding the compositional history of the Gospels. The compositional history, that is to say, where did these Gospels come from? How did they come to be written down? There are three, maybe four decades between the time that Jesus lived, said what he said, did what he did, and then the Gospels are written down, right? So what is the background to the writing of the Gospels? How did we get from Jesus' sayings and actions to the written material? Surely, uh, as soon as Jesus was resurrected, uh, the stories of Jesus went abroad. And as these stories were told, what was the life of those stories as they moved from storyteller to storyteller and from town to town? Did they change, in other words, right? And then equally, if you've ever read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, right, one right after another, you may have thought to yourself, gee, these, these surely look very similar, right? And so the question becomes, did Matthew have a copy of Mark? Did Mark have a copy of Matthew? Did Luke have a copy of both? Was there still another source out there that they drew upon? And so all these questions go into the matrix of trying to discern how did these Gospels come about, the compositional history. Now, why are people uh, curious about that question? Uh, we got believers and unbelievers alike asking those sort of questions. And the reason is we want to discover the origins of Christianity. This thing called the church, this international movement uh, that burst onto the historical scene. Where did it come from? What is the historical antecedent that gave rise and birth to the church? One particular passage that we're going to look at that might give us some insight into this is in Mark chapter 8. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 8, and let me read that for us right now. We're going to look at verses 22 through 25. Mark 8, 22 through 25. It says this, And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man, and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands upon him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men, but they look like trees walking. And then again he laid his hands upon his eyes, and he looked intently, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. He saw everything clearly. Now, this is a peculiar story in the Gospels. It's peculiar because only Mark tells this story. Matthew and Luke don't repeat this story. Other stories they repeat, but not this one. It's also peculiar because it's the only one where we see Jesus having to take two shots, right, at completing the miracle. He heals him. He kind of sees. He sees men like trees walking, so some vertical figures, but blurry enough. I don't know what they are, but they're walking around. They're not trees, but they don't look like men either because I can't quite see very clearly, right? Uh, and so why don't Matthew and Mark also use this story? Right? Well, one of the hypotheses is, is that it's too embarrassing. It's too embarrassing that Mark wrote first. He got access to this story. He wrote it down, and Matthew and Luke come along, and they say, well, uh, you know, Jesus and, and the high Christology that we want to portray uh, surrounding Jesus uh, is weakened if we have him having to take two shots at this miracle. So they're a little embarrassed. And so there's this hypothesis that, that the early Christians didn't quite see Jesus as divine, as it were, but uh, the first Christians didn't, first generation of Christians, but subsequent generations developed that idea of a divine uh, Messiah. And Matthew and Luke are contributing to that by erasing some of the embarrassment that Jesus couldn't get the job done in one shot and present him, therefore, as more powerful. That's one hypothesis. Uh, but then the question becomes, well, where did the story come from? Where did it come from? Uh, if it's got this history to it before it's written down in Mark and subsequent history ignored by Matthew and Luke, right, where did it come from? Well, uh, a lot of these scholars have operated from a naturalistic and materialistic worldview, where they conclude a priori that there is no supernatural, and the possibility of miracles is out, 
There is, there is uh, this world is a closed universe. All there is is the material, physical stuff of the world. And so therefore, there has to be a naturalistic explanation for what Jesus really did. And, then, and so it would look something like this. It would look something like this. Uh, maybe Jesus was kind to a blind man one day and showed some kind of compassion. He's a social outsider, but Jesus went out of his way to show him kindness. And as that story was told from one uh, from year to year, decade to decade, there's time for it to develop into a more miracle story, right? And so the early Christians were very zealous to show Jesus as a miracle worker, and they took this simple episode one day in Jesus' life and developed it into a miracle story. And as that story is told all over uh, the, 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 the growing Christian world, right, from church to church, it takes on different forms as different people then retell the story. And so some people would continue to evolve the story into where Jesus could heal the man in one shot. And so what you have in Matthew and Luke is the story of blind Bartimaeus, where Jesus does heal him in one shot. And so there's this evolutionary uh, development to the story, growing out of some very simple uh, action that Jesus took one day. But what that simple action was is completely lost to us in history. So we really don't know. All we have is what Mark and Matthew and Luke kind of give us a window into what may have happened in the development of writing their books. Does that make sense? Or maybe Jesus just pulled off a hoax one day. He organized it with somebody pretending to be blind and came along and did this miracle, quote unquote, in cahoots with uh, a perfectly fine, able-bodied, seeing person, uh, and together they pulled off this hoax. And again, the story then takes on different forms as the story is told and told. Or maybe it's just purely mythological. The Christians just made it up wholesale and uh, placed it into Jesus' life. Either way, you have naturalistic and materialistic presuppositions governing the reading of the text and then equally uh, a set of questions brought to the text, what is the origin of Christianity, right, that motivates the scholar to treat the text in that way in the first place. But what if these are the wrong questions? What if these are the wrong questions to ask? If you bring the wrong questions to your field of study, you will get wrong answers, right? Uh, you will get answers that have nothing to do with what you're really searching for, the history of the text or the origins of Christianity. Equally, what if bringing materialistic and naturalistic frames to bear on the scriptures distort the scriptures or any other piece of writing so that you don't actually get after what the text is intended to do? What if, on the other hand, we took seriously this consideration, that Mark did not write these verses in the abstract. Rather, Mark wrote all of Mark. Mark wrote Mark 1 through 16 in their entirety to be held together and then presented to his reading audience, what we call the Markan community, right? And so therefore, this story, as well as every other story in the Gospel of Mark, which I believe under the direction of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, right, uh, all the other stories in Mark are placed together to create a particular narratological flow, a discourse, as it were, to develop his whole presentation of Jesus. Therefore, by abstracting one story, comparing it to Matthew and Mark, creating hypotheses of its past and origin is to do violence, actually, to the literary work that is Mark, that one man wrote down in its entirety and presented to his community. So what we're going to do here is we're going to get after this story by looking at all of Mark. How is this story situated in that whole narratological discourse that we call Mark 1 through 16? And to do that, we'll look at his, the, the, the wider context of Mark. Then we'll zoom in and look at the narrow context of this particular passage. And then equally, the wider context, again, of the gospel of Mark. So for the, for the wider context, here's a drawing that... I like to use that I think represents the structure of the Gospel of Mark. There's uh, your first verse and an introduction leading up to verse 1, 1 through 15, right? And then the story functionally ends in 16 verse 8 and then continues on uh, with, a, with an epilogue to uh, 16 20. 
and then situated right in the middle of Mark, the, 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 the narrative splits pretty evenly in half, is the Great Confession, Peter's Great Confession. So up here at the top, you have 8, 27 through 30. That's Peter's Confession. And then on the other side, heading down the other side of the narrative, you have 8, 31 through uh, 36, I believe. And so what happens then in the Gospel of Mark, uh, our author, Mark, has divided Jesus' life into two basic sections. And the emphasis on the first half of the, the narrative of Jesus' life is, in the first half, is Jesus' power. Jesus' power on this side of the gospel. So, so from 115 to 827, you have his stories of Jesus casting out demons, healing people. You think of Peter's mother-in-law, Jairus' daughter, the man with the withered hand, and these kinds of things. And then equally, his power uh, over nature. So this is where he calms the storms, where he walks on water, the feeding of the 4,000, the feeding of the 5,000. Even Jesus' teachings in this section, uh, the emphasis is on his authority and therefore power in his teaching. All right, so the emphasis is all on Jesus' power on this side of the gospel. To zoom in now on the narrow context, our story is situated right before the pinnacle on the first side. So our story is situated right here. So let's look at what leads up to it, and then equally what flows out of it. So if you look at 827, the very next story, you have Peter's confession. Let's read that. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do men say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others say one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter, had answer, Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he charged him to tell no one about him. And he began to teach that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not on the side of God but the side of men. So Peter is a really enigmatic character. He, we're asked the question in this section right here, who, is, who do people say that I am? Who is Jesus? And Peter answers correctly, you are the Christ. But then Peter immediately begins to demonstrate his ignorance because Jesus mentions right after Peter calls him the Christ, Jesus says the Son of Man, the Christ, who you just affirmed, must be suffer. And that is brand new to Peter. Because all Peter has seen is Jesus' power. And the demonstration of Jesus' power is one of the main reasons that Peter confesses, you must be the Christ. To suddenly turn and say, and the Son of Man must suffer, is what doesn't connect in Peter's mind. This is the story right after our double healing of the blind man, and leaning over the top of the gospel to move from, you are the Christ because I've seen your power, into, well, there's something else I have to show you. Not only my power, but also my suffering. So the second half of the gospel is entirely focused on Jesus' suffering and his call that his followers also take up their cross and follow him. Three times in this section, Second half of the gospel, he predicts his death, calls his followers equally to take up their cross and follow him. And it's also in this side of the gospel where you have the discussion of who is the greatest? Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus' answer is, if you want to be great, you've got to be the servant of all. You too must sacrifice for your uh, brothers and sisters if you want to be great. Because the, answer, the short answer to the question is, who is the greatest, is, of course, Jesus. Jesus came to serve and to save his people, to suffer and sacrifice on their behalf. Therefore, in smaller ways, you too can do that for others, and that's what will make you great in the kingdom. That's all on this side, the suffering and sacrifice side of the gospel. Now, with that in mind, go back to chapter 8, verse 21. What leads up to this episode in Mark? The last question on the page in verse 21 is this. Don't you yet understand? 
After several miracles and teachings of Jesus, he concludes by asking, don't you understand? And then that's when he heals the blind man twice. And immediately following that, Peter is the one who demonstrates he does understand, but doesn't understand. In other words, Jesus heals this man right here as a prelude to Peter's ability to see and not see. He has in his mind half of a gospel. He has half of a gospel in his mind. Now there's another story all the way over here of another blind man. Turn in your Bibles to chapter 10. I mentioned him earlier. I said he's in Matthew and Luke. He's also in Mark. In Mark 10, 44, is where you have Jesus' conclusion to the question, who is the greatest in the kingdom? Whoever would be first, or would be the greatest, must be the servant of all. And then 1045. For the Son of Man also came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so Jesus concludes this teaching on what it means to be great by pointing to himself as the one who gives his life for the salvation of others. And then immediately you have another blind man story. Verse 46. They came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, Bartimaeus, a blind man, a beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jump down to verse 51. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Master, let me receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your sight has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him on the way. This time, Jesus heals the man in one shot. And the very next thing that happens in the Gospel of Mark, leading out of this story, is Jesus enters into Jerusalem. Chapter 11, boom, he's into Jerusalem, and he's entering into Passion Week. In other words, what I'm getting at here is that these two stories, the half-seeing man and the whole-seeing man, work together to, to teach us that there is a way to see half of Jesus, to be half right on Jesus. But what did Jesus say to Peter when he understood half of the gospel, namely the power half and not the suffering half, the authority half, but not the self-sacrifice half of the gospel? He said, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. What Mark is getting at is, if you follow Jesus, Jesus' first call to follow people is up here, is down here. He calls the, the brothers, the fishermen, to, to follow him, right? But he said the same thing over here. After I talked about my suffering, he says, back in chapter 8, thirty-four. after announcing his suffering for the first time, he called to him the multitude with his disciples and said to them, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So twice, Jesus has said, follow me. Once, as he calls disciples to himself and demonstrates his power, evokes from Peter the confession, you are the Christ. But then immediately says, <clears throat> you must also follow me in my suffering. And if you're unwilling to do that, if you like the power, but not the suffering, you like the authority, but not the sacrifice, well then, you have a half a gospel. And a half a gospel is a satanic gospel. Only once you understand my suffering, and I teach on my suffering, and how you're called equally into my suffering, only then can we say that you have the full gospel. And like blind Bartimaeus, you now see clearly.
And if you're willing to follow Jesus in his power, amen, we love that. We love that he's the King of kings and Lord of lords. We love that he he hears prayer. We love that he forgives us and that he's returning again in power and glory. But you're not willing to walk with him on the road of suffering and self-sacrifice and self-denial. Well, then you have a half gospel. And a half gospel is a satanic gospel. But... If you see his power and you see his suffering and you're still compelled, as it says at the end of the Bartimaeus story, did you hear what I said? He got up and followed him on the road. You're still willing to follow Jesus. Then it's because Jesus himself has opened your eyes. Jesus himself has given you the clarity to see that he is the Christ and he is the suffering Christ. An atonement for sins who equally calls us not to die vicariously for others, But in lesser ways, self-sacrifice, identify with him, therefore identify with his people, and give up whatever he's calling us to give up for the sake of the gospel. Now Mark is a great storyteller. Mark's a great storyteller. We believe that Mark wrote to Christians living in Rome in the first century. Um, And in Rome, there was a particular persecution for the Christians uh, during this this season of uh, early Christianity. And so therefore, Mark is not just telling us a story of Peter, blind Bartimaeus, and so forth to get his theology across. He's equally reaching out to those Roman Christians to say that if you see Jesus in his suffering and in his power, uh, shall we say, you're not, you're not on the wrong side of history. There's a claim that Jesus is Lord, but equally Caesar is Lord. And the way you demonstrate who is Lord, well, it's, it's by their strength. <laughs> and so the Christians, as a small and marginalized, even suffering community, this is the way that Mark can reach out to them and say, you don't have it wrong. This is right. The life of the church is patterned on the life of the Messiah. He had power. You also have power. You have access to the same God through Jesus as you read on this side of the gospel. But equally, don't be surprised. It's not abnormal. God has not fallen asleep. Jesus has not knocked off his throne when you're also called to suffer for his name. For the life of the Messiah becomes the pattern for the life of the church. And then equally, the life of the church, right, is then the paradigm for the individual Christian as well, your own individual suffering for the gospel. And now, 2,000 years later, I think we still need to hear that, we still need to hear that message. It's very easy to be tempted by certain um, shiny objects (laughs) within Christianity. There's a lot of, there's power. There's forgiveness of sins. There's regeneration by the Holy Spirit. There's access to God through prayer. It's the fellowship of the saints. Right? And all these, and, and we could go on. And we love that. that would, all those things alone would give us something like our best life now. But there's also a call to suffer with Jesus, to identify with the ignominity of the man who was crucified, and to sacrifice for others for their good. And some of us love the power, we don't like the suffering. If you're drawn to Christianity by the power, and the, the, the good things that it can immediately bring into your life, and there are a lot of them, but unwilling to walk with Jesus and to bear your cross and identify with him as well in his suffering, then you have a half gospel. You, as, Peter, as Jesus says to Peter, are on the side of Satan. There's a whole gospel that is clearly seen, like blind Bartimaeus, and there's a half gospel that is unclearly seen by Satan and those on the side of Satan. I believe that when dealing with this passage right here and any other passage in the Gospel of Mark or anywhere else in the Bible, these are the right questions to ask. How has the author embedded this teaching in the larger discourse of the whole book, in this case, Mark, so that the dynamics of the whole book can influence how we're interpreting this passage, and then equally how this passage uh, exerts an influence on the rest of the book. And so the prehistory 
the compositional history of the Gospel of Mark might be a fool's errand. What matters is that this is the way Mark constructed the story, and this is the way Mark has delivered this story to the church. And so the final product of Mark, chapter 1 through chapter 16, is the whole context of what the Spirit has inspired and the testimony that is to go to the church and the whole world throughout time, world without end. And so when we ask the question of, well, the question's still on the table, where did Christianity come from? If we remove the materialistic and naturalistic presuppositions from our consideration, and we think for a moment there is a creator God, there is a God who made the material and the nature, and he is intimately involved with his world and always has been, then it comes as no surprise that if anybody can heal the blind, if anybody with a word can control nature, if anybody can raise the dead, it's the son of that God. In fact, it's that God himself incarnate in Jesus Christ who can do these sort of things. And so what is the origin of Christianity? Well, people witnessed a true healing on this day and on this day. And people witnessed a true resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day. And that is the reality, that is the experience that infused Christianity in those early years with enough life and power and energy to outlast and outstrip the very Roman Empire that tried to destroy it for actually hundreds of years. Does that make sense? That the origins of Christianity can be traced back to Jesus himself, the things he truly said, the things he truly did, and that the telling of those stories in a full narrative discourse was compelling to the Roman Christians and compelling to all other Christians for 2,000 years who have ever read this gospel. And so we understand that the origins of Christianity are from the power of God to heal blind people and then for subsequent generations heal spiritually blind people who previously could not see the glory of God in Jesus Christ. But then, by teaching on his power and his suffering, Mark is saying, if you read the whole thing and you're still a believer and you still want to follow Jesus, there's power in the resurrection, but there's suffering in the cross. And if you can see that clearly, like blind Bartimaeus, it's because Jesus has touched your eyes to see that, and you now follow him. I hope you're edified by this window into ITS. Our goal of producing these videos is that you would be edified by the teaching coming from our professors. Secondly, also to highlight our professors and the way they teach in the classroom so you can see their biblical and theological fidelity. And then thirdly, you will surely have noticed from the chalkboard and the setup uh, that these are very reminiscent of the videos that R.C. Sproul used to make. So this is our way of giving a little homage to him, a mark of gratitude. We've learned much from him and in replicating his style, we're saying thank you to him. Uh, in that having learned from him, we want to pass these things on to the next generation. If you'd like to learn more about Indianapolis Theological Seminary, please visit us online, indisem.org.